Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's study. At this time, we're going to segue into a portion of the topic that we covered regarding this with Uriah Smith this last week, but we're going to be using some different source materials. We will return to Uriah Smith very likely either tomorrow or Tuesday. So at this time, as we begin our study, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this new week and the opportunities that you are providing us. We ask, Father, for your direction, that you will show us that which we need to understand for this time in which we live. Be with us, we ask. May your spirit attend us. May your angels protect us. May our minds be opened so that we may rightly divide the word of truth. Help us now. Direct us, we pray, as we assemble here before you. Thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now. Last week, we were addressing several points as we looked at the time in which the initial publishment of the book Thoughts on Daniel was taking place. Currently, we have many that believe that they are addressing things properly within the church and some within the movement. Now, as we go to study the Bible, Exactly how are we to look to study Scripture? What is our guide? Well, I mean, first you have, of course, Miller's Rules, which means that the the one who inspired the Scriptures is the one that interprets it. We use the Scriptures to interpret the Scriptures. Okay. Now, is this to be a situation where we make use of what men would say are we to take the word of man there there is a place for listening to what other people say you don't take the word of man over the word of god but you know we're men and we're studying so you know people are listening to us to some degree but the bible is the authority not man okay now as i was looking through multiple situations this last week I ran across a website that's been put forth by Eugene Pruitt. Now, Mm -hmm. are all of those in attendance here familiar with Eugene Pruitt? Well, I am, because he opposed uh, the 2520. Eugene Pruitt. And I had some conversations with him. Eugene Pruitt is a pastor to the northeast of where I live. You're correct. He's very much in opposition to the 2520. Yet I find it very interesting as he places these things on his website. From this portion of the website, weaned from the breast, he makes the statement, at a recent workers' meeting, I was teaching a group of pastors about how to study the Bible properly. One of these raised his hands and, when called, raised an objection to my use of Isaiah 28, 9, and 10. I was teaching that in these verses, God is offering to teach a class of men who look to him personally for guidance and who compare scripture with scripture. Now, I found this interesting because as I came to understand, Eugene Pruitt is not one to compare scripture with scripture. Really? I I found he's actually pretty good. Okay. I've I've listened to a lot of sermons. He's... He's he's pretty much uh, a Miller's Rule kind of guy. Yet he doesn't accept the 2520. No, he doesn't accept the 2520. But that doesn't mean that, generally speaking, he doesn't compare Scripture with Scripture. It's just in that one instance, he he takes what James White says. Uh, in his view, it's James White. And, and to him, that's just kind of the final word. So... But generally speaking, he does compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay. Now, in this situation where he is making use of Isaiah 28, 9, and 10, where he is, where Pruitt is teaching these pastors how to study the Bible, he states, but the pastor opined that the drunkards of Ephraim are the incoherent teachers in this passage, and that, as a consequence, it makes a poor launching place for a lecture on how to study the Bible correctly. Would we have any difference 
of opinion with him in this particular statement. Well, and I, I've run into this argument before. There's a they read it incorrectly. That is, um, God says that they're supposed to study because they're drunkards of Ephraim. They're Protestants, and um, that they need to to study precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Right? It's it's like a little child's rhyme, and and basically God is saying you need to go back to the really basic thing of just accepting scripture and um and then because you're not going to obey scripture then these things are going to happen to you precept upon precept precept upon precept line upon line here a little and there a little so basically either you study and understand the truth from god's word and and approach it as a little child and if you don't those things are still going to happen to you. You're, you're going to have those judgments fit in context. They don't use line upon line. They don't compare scripture in order to understand Isaiah 28. So it's it, it's um, a human interpretation of that passage taken out of context. Now, if we were, but, but I've run into that same explanation before. If we look at this a little bit further, the ninth verse is, of course, preceded by eight other verses. Because Mm -hmm. 28.1, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Now, this is being written to those that are determined to be the drunkards of Ephraim. You cannot be a drunk without consuming something that makes you inebriated. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Now, if we're looking at this verse, 28.1, in the spiritual context, what is being consumed to make one drunk? Wine or alcohol wine. Right, but what spiritually is that wine? Babylon. The wine of Babylon. So is this first verse being written to describe those of Ephraim accepting of the wine of Babylon, that they are consuming the wine of Babylon. Now, the second verse continues, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. What spiritually are we hearing here? What is Isaiah trying to say? And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty upon the residue of his people. Are the drunkards of Ephraim going to have the Lord of hosts as their crown of glory? If I understand the question right, it'd be no. That is the the way that I would look at this as well. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for the strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they also have erred through wine. And through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. The next verse. For all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. In these situations, in addressing what we were learning this last week, looking at Uriah Smith and what he had been addressing regarding Daniel 11. Can you properly address the prophecies and set aside specifically the understanding of the seven times that Miller came to? Can you also set aside the understanding of the daily that we have been addressing? If you set aside those two, you won't. Um, interpret it right 
Correct. So in this situation where Eugene Pruitt is teaching a group of pastors about how to study the Bible properly, if he has chosen to set aside the understanding of the 2520, how can he be teaching these pastors? If a ship is sailing across an ocean and it comes off by one degree in its calculation, will the ship be able to go from its initial port to its intended destination? Well, the the big problem Eugene Pruitt is going to have is he's not really going to understand and precept upon precept, line upon line in the way that we do, because he's not going to be able to apply uh, the other verses that address the line. Like he's not going to be able to address where it talks about a line of judgment and the plummet of righteousness. He's not going to be able to understand Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1, or, or many other verses, because he doesn't have that understanding of the 2520. So, so in a sense, he, he's drunk as well. So in Uriah Smith setting aside the understanding of the 2520, was Smith then drunk with wine? And is Smith also being described within the, these verses? Mm-hmm. Now, Pruitt continues, this short article will address that objection directly by showing from the Bible itself the purpose and intent of Isaiah 28 to 29 prophetic revelation. Along the way, scripture will teach us important things relevant to our life today. I will begin by making an overview of the passage of Isaiah 28 and 29. Then I will progress to looking at the contextual data that has a bearing on how we should understand the passage. Then we will look at the historical fulfillment of this prophecy. Finally, I will end with a synopsis of the data and with a reasonable conclusion. If we read this on the surface, how many different methods of biblical interpretation is Pruitt attempting to make use of? Well, I don't know if he's using different methods. I mean, it's sort of what we do. We look at the context of something that's being said, and we look at the historical fulfillment of of things. But um, he's not really doing line upon line. Okay. So he would be using the historical, but the the historical um, what do they call it? Historical critical method, or uh, let me see. No, it's um, called. I can't remember what they call it. <laughs> okay. It, it, he he's using this the system that Protestant or pastors use. Now. Here we have a situation because we are observing a pastor that is gaining traction, but yet he is, he varies from what Father Miller would teach in very minor points. Now, was Father Miller appointed by our Heavenly Father to give a message to this world? Did Miller give a message that God appointed? Yeah. Now, if God has given the message, is that something to which we should pay attention? I think that's in great controversy, mm-hmm. ain't it, where, where God um, said that he sent his angel to a farmer, right? Correct. I believe that we would find that both in the books of Spirit of Prophecy and in the Great Controversy. Now, in our comparisons that we're going to be doing specifically with the as with Uriah Smith, <clears throat> we have an example of what can happen with someone that is, for his time, was at the heart of the movement, the heart of the church, but he differed in one small aspect. Now, yesterday, there, were some, there, there was a document that was shared regarding a recent Sabbath presentation. I haven't had the time to read through the whole document yet. I've been just just a little tied up. But we have situations that are current, occurring all the way around us where we are going to encounter those that are going to differ in small aspects from what we are working to understand. Now, at many times when 
there are those that differ with us in small aspects. Many of them seek to cast us out rather than setting down to try to study the point that's being made. Are we in any regard to look to cast others out? Are we to use rumor, innuendo, gossip against those with whom we do not fully agree? No, of course not. Now, as I look at these situations, here Pruitt continues that God speaks to hell-bend leaders under the figure of drunken royalty of Ephraim. He promises to overthrow these with his mighty one. These rich persons will be like a fading flower at the same time that God is blessing his remnant. But even the comparatively faithful persons have been overcome with wine so that the prophets and priests err in their vision and stumble in judgment. God explains the condition of these and of others receiving his helpful teaching. Persons must be saved from relying on other teachers or from neglecting connected Bible study. Would we disagree with these statements on the surface? No. He continued, Jesus uses this method and harmonized with these conditions. He taught people, he taught principles upon principles. He invited the Jews to come to him for rest, but they refused. What was he offering for them to come to rest from? Well, sin. Yet, what were the Jews holding on to? Well, uh, their pride. And what was their pride beyond their temple? Well, they had pride in their position. The leaders did. Because that's what he's talking to. Didn't they also have pride in the laws that man had made to show them the steps that they should have been making? Yeah, in the time of Christ? Yes. Yeah. In the time of Isaiah, they didn't have all those extra laws yet, though. Right. So those are things added much later. In many conversations that I've had recently, there are those that are surprised when they begin to consider how today there are 28 fundamental principles that we must agree to in order to become members in good standing of the corporate church. In the time of Ellen and James White, From 1846, let's say, until 1863, did those 28 conditions exist? No. Now, when I was baptized, I mean, there might have been 27 fundamental beliefs, but there was 13 baptismal vows, and there was no reference to the fundamental beliefs. I found it interesting as I prepare for my mother's memorial today that I ran into her certificate of baptism in 1970. Contained in that certificate of baptism were 27 fundamental beliefs and the understanding of what she was agreeing to in being baptized. That's kind of odd because I didn't have the 27 fundamental beliefs referenced in my baptismal certificate. 54 years. I was baptized in 82. Yeah, see, in, in, the, in this situation, a span of 12 years from when mother was baptized to when you were baptized can have a huge difference. We have seen many changes over these years. Would Ellen and James White, if they were alive today, have agreed with the 28 fundamental positions of the corporate church? My thought is that they probably would not. Well, they definitely wouldn't. Now, after this, Pruitt writes, and so after his ascension, Jesus used the gift of tongues to impress the Jews that he was their Messiah. And even the apostles that received that gift continue to teach by comparing Scripture with Scripture, here a little and there a little. Now, if we are doing this in accordance with Miller's rules, are we then accepting of the rules themselves? Are we adhering to the way in which Father Miller taught and preached? 
I would think the answer would be yes. But there are those today that give much lip service to this because they don't want to accept all of the points that Father Miller had made. Now, our situation, as we are going to be looking this week at the documents with Uriah Smith, is to examine how his position differs from what we've come to understand and to examine the difference in what he originally wrote versus what he later re-edited and presented by 1897. In many cases, over that 29-year period, Smith made very minor changes in his presentation to represent his understanding of what these verses were meaning. Smith's book has been edited and reissued multiple times. Many times there are small changes in verbiage. Many times there are major changes in presentation. All are being done under the guise of making Smith's book more understandable for those today. Now, Pruitt on his website has several other points. The lead article that he has in this section should be up here in just a moment. My computer is running kind of slowly today, kind of like I am. Now, Pruitt, in this initial article, says, Recently I watched a series of three lectures by John Paulian on the topic of Sunday laws. These lectures were hosted and promoted by the Central California Conference and by its administration. As I watched, I observed that the administrator said repeatedly, that they did not want to argue about these points, but only to have a friendly academic discussion. So please read this reply, not as a mean-spirited polemic, but as a friendly discussion with academics. It's interesting to me that this can be placed as an academic discussion. What I intend to show herein is that John Pollyan's eight principles of prophetic interpretation are not usefully reliable that the line of demarcation between conditional and unconditional prophecy is well-defined in Scripture and does not fall where Paulian assigns it, that Revelation 13 is most certainly unconditional prophecy and will be fulfilled as written, that contrary to Paulian, Ellen White's visions regarding Sunday legislation did not change over time, even if they did become more detailed in nature, that Paulian is fulfilled filling a very significant prophecy about making of none effect the testimonies. That Paulian's idea that times have changed since the 1880s in such a way to negate some of the specifics of Ellen White's writings is fallacious in significant ways. That the Bible teachings about the seal of God and the mark of the beast are watertight and able to be used to make confident statements about the future. Would we have any difference of opinion with his, quote, friendly academic discussion on these seven points? No. Can you have a friendly discussion with academics? Yeah. Okay. He continues, in the spirit of a friendly... Why couldn't you? Well, I'm looking at his next statement. In the spirit of a friendly discussion... I will forego making editorial comments about how dangerous and destructive I view some of these errors to be. So Pruitt is saying that Paulian's points are dangerous and destructive. Mm -hmm. I'm reading this. Yeah, they're extremely dangerous and destructive. Okay. So, So just one of the points there. So, you know, I grew up with, you know, liberal theology from the United Church of Canada. And this one point particularly that's in point number six, the idea that times have changed, this is this is basically one of the principles that that guides the new theology. That progress, that we understand things more clearly than people in the past, that um, we're more modern, so the basic premise is that because things are more modern, 
they're more true. That we're always moving from uh, something more primitive to something more sophisticated, and and that that's that premise is completely false. There's there's no way just because we're more modern that that means we're more correct because we have more knowledge that somehow things in the past are just outdated. But but that that's that's almost really the the basic premise of what we see today. It's following the trends of uh, uh, that's almost completely. If if we got rid of that one idea. Uh, we wouldn't have the problems we have today in in interpreting the Bible. Well, when I read this, I look at his point number five. He is giving a present day application that Paulian is fulfilling a very significant prophecy of making of none effect the testimony. I look at the historical application because Smith did an amazing job to attempt to make of none effect the testimonies for his time. So are we to consider that this is a prophetic situation that was given in the 1880s and being fulfilled now, or was this being given and fulfilled at the time that this was presented and has continued to this current day? Well, okay, making of none effect the testimony. So... Um, if you just think about this in the context of what I said about um, things are progressive, that we believe that truth is progressive, that is almost it, it evolves. So we know Ellen White, I know my internet's unstable. Hopefully I'm coming across clearly. So we know that there is new light and new light is an unfolding of established truths. It's an unfolding of old light, but what the modern mind says is that new light undoes old light that is what was once true is no longer true now i don't think that i would put uriah smith in that class um uriah smith is always trying to support the pioneers understanding of things if you if you read what he's saying he's like even when he takes the position he does on daniel chapter 11 he takes that position because it's the pioneer understanding in his mind. He's not trying to take some new interpretation of Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 to 45. So I don't know if I would quite put Uriah Smith in that class. Uh, th he has other problems, but I don't think he has the view that uh, what is newer is better, which Pauline does have. Okay. Now, this situation. It had continued, but I encourage the reader to be thinking about values and about repercussions. These are important, even in friendly conversations. Let's start with conditional and unconditional prophecies. In the story of Joseph explaining the dream to Pharaoh, Genesis gives us a principle of prophetic interpretation. Now, we've covered this in the past, and Genesis 41:32 states, and for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It be, is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. From this, we gather that unconditional prophecies can be recognized by their repetitive nature. And as the pairs in Genesis of repeated dreams, sheaves, stars, bread, juice, cows, corn, were each given in diverse metaphors, we can easily identify Daniel and Revelation as unconditional prophecy. To say this again, nothing that Pharaoh could do could avert the seven years of famine. And nothing Nebuchadnezzar could do could prevent the coming of Persia. The variety of metaphors in Daniel 2 and 7 that show this also show that the thing is established by God. A conditional prophecy, by contrast, is one that is based on a reward for commendable or reprehensible behavior. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Jeremiah 18, 7 to 8. Now, it's interesting that he would come back with a verse using a 187. 
So promises of reward and punishment are conditional. In the case of Judas, we learn some prophecies of an unconditional element, someone will betray Jesus, also include a conditional element that someone will be Judas. This simple line that helps anyone identify conditional and unconditional prophecies. And as Revelation 7, 13 through 18, go over the same ground of prophecy with a variety of figures, we can be certain that like the rest of Daniel and Revelation, these are prophecies that are unconditional, established by God. Now, if this is the case, then is Leviticus 25 and 26, a conditional or unconditional prophecy. And if that, you know, when we establish in what manner it's supposed to be, then why cannot it be accepted by Pruitt in the way that it has been accepted by Father Miller and by those of us that are sk- that are continuing the study using Miller's rules? Leviticus 26 is, is conditional. I would agree. So it's a conditional prophecy. But... We know that once we get to a certain point, like Isaiah chapter 7, right? Isaiah chapter 7 is addressing Leviticus 26. And it's now an unconditional prophecy once you get to that point. So there's, it's a conditional prophecy and it's, that's why it's fulfilled. Ellen White says, uh, partially fulfilled by the captivity of uh, partially fulfilled during the period of the judges, right? There's partial fulfillments of Leviticus 26, but it receives a more complete fulfillment in the captivity of Ephraim or northern Israel uh, in Assyria by Assyria and Judah by Babylon. So at, at a certain point, God does set in motion unconditional aspects of Leviticus 26. But initially, as a prophecy, it's un- it's conditional. It's upon condition. Once those conditions are met, then it becomes unconditional. If that makes sense. You were kind of breaking up there, but I think the point has been brought across. Smith, in the articles that he wrote that were against Miller's understanding of the conditions of Leviticus 25 and 26, attempted to use the argument that the verbiage chosen does not support Miller's understanding, that the language being used should have been different if this was indeed a prophecy. In Leviticus 26 itself? Now, Pruitt continues, Adventists have access to some of the most comprehensive and succinct rules of prophetic interpretation that have been penned. I am thinking of those of William Miller. And even today, I find persons making common errors in their interpretations of prophecy that if they had read his rules, they might have avoided. As an example, Miller explained that elements in prophecy should be understood literally unless good sense and or context makes a literal understanding irrational. Leopards don't have four heads, therefore the leopard is a metaphor and other beasts sensibly likewise. Counter to this principle, many persons interpreting Daniel 11 recently have said, since the prophecy begins literally, it should be consistently literal all the way through. Wasn't this position also taken during the time in which Smith was penning thoughts on Daniel? Yeah, and it and it's also was done by Josiah Litch as well. So that was part of the problem when we examined the foundation and we looked at how they were interpreting Daniel chapter eleven, verse forty to forty-five. They weren't following Miller's rules. They right. they right they they didn't understand it moving from literal to to figurative, and and they want to continue to apply the. Uh, that the, if it's the king of the north, that he has to occupy Syria. And if it's the king of the south, he has to occupy Egypt. And that, that was actually inconsistent. But it was an assumption that while we started literally, we have to continually be literal. Throughout, in order to rightly divide the word of truth, 
we are going to be called upon to look at those items that make sense literally and those that do not make sense and do harm to the verse. Pruitt continued, counter to this principle, many persons interpreting Daniel 11 recently have said, since the prophecy begins literally, it should be consistently literal all the way through. But this is bogus in the most obvious ways. The seals, for instance, begin metaphorically and end literally. And the trumpets similarly begin metaphorically and end literally. And the plagues start literally and become metaphorical in the sixth plague. In short, many lines of prophecies combine metaphorical and literal elements. Miller's rule works great in real-life application to these Bible prophecies. But what about Paulian's principles? As tools for the Bible student, do they help you understand the meaning of prophetic verses? I'll leave you to answer that question. Let's go over each of them briefly. God is consistent. This is certainly true. And it is perhaps helpful to know that God can be trusted and that, as Paulian says, and as Solomon also says, history repeats itself. Is it only helpful to know that God can be trusted? Is it only perhaps helpful to know that God can be trusted? What do you mean? I'm taking his words directly, where he says perhaps helpful to know that God can be trusted. Can't we trust God in all things? Yeah, well, he says it's certainly true. But the reason why he says perhaps helpful, because he's he's adding other things to it, that, that there's more to it than just that God can be trusted, right? Because he, he's going to go on. Then he says that God is not predictable, according to Paulian. By this, Paulian means that God gives typical prophecies in a way that may not be fulfilled just as it is written, and consequently, not just as we expect. To this, I would say, God gave Daniel and Revelation to us to be understood in our time. Every element that is already fulfilled has been fulfilled just as it is written. And as that is hundreds of elements and details, there's no reason to suppose that the future elements will be less reliably fulfilled as written. There is a truth that Paulian expresses under this heading. God's ways are beyond our ability to understand, quoting, inscrutable. He may fulfill written prophecies in ways we do not expect, but they will nonetheless be fulfilled as written. Our inability to understand God's ways are not the result, as Paulian alleges, of God resisting being predictable. They are rather the result of our human weakness. Yeah, I would definitely agree with this because we've experienced this in this movement. And and it's the human weakness that God God is trying to um, help us overcome. Right, to depend upon him. So when we look at July 18th, you know, a failed prediction, well, the problem wasn't with God. The problem was with us. If we had learned to depend upon God, if we had developed a Christ-like character, that prophecy would have been fulfilled at the time that was predicted. I believe we've established that the point regarding July 18th is that The movement, we were not prepared to give the message that God would have us to give, and that we have a work of character improvement that needs to be completed, that our characters are not at this point reflective of Christ's character. Is that how you would see this as well? Yes. It is not that God failed in what was to be done. It is that we did not understand that God's ways are not our ways. Just as Jonah came to a point with Nineveh where he gave a warning message about destruction of Nineveh and then was disappointed because it was not destroyed because the people repented. We have been in a situation where we have questioned the validity of Palmoni and what we are to be understanding at this time. Are we ever to question God's purposes? 
Well, we know that his purposes are righteous. I'm just thinking about questioning God's purposes. and I mean, let me think about this. Would it fit that Jesus at the cross was even questioning the Father, if it be possible? You know, he knew it wasn't, but he questioned. So is it wrong yeah, to strive? Think, is it wrong to strive with God? Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's what I would call questioning. Um, I guess maybe it depends on on the context of that, because because human nature is contrary to God's nature, and so human nature naturally that price nature that says if possible, right? That that's the human nature is is in conflict with God's purposes. So human nature always does question God's purposes. And so that's what I think Christ was expressing. But I don't think he truly, as in his mind, he questioned God's purposes. Yeah. But, yeah. but he yeah. felt it. But he felt it, you know. And and I think that all of us feel that. Like, why is this happening? But but that's but we can still trust God even if we we know that it, it doesn't make sense to us. And and Christ always trusted his father. In that sense, he never really questioned his father. I get, right. And I, I guess I'm just making that observation that we all question. So not not to be too hard on ourselves for having that human condition is kind of what I'm getting at, I guess. Is it wrong? Well, yeah, because our, our nature is natural. natural. It, 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 right. It, it is wrong if we right. we allow that questioning to to bring in doubt because that's a lack of faith one more time if if we allow that questioning to bring doubt a lack of faith then it is wrong because then we're not trusting in god right so if if that if those feelings cause us to not trust god then yeah that would be wrong Right. So the act itself isn't wrong. It's the result or where it may lead that's dangerous, I guess. Yeah. Well, think of think of a child. I mean, he may question his father, but if he still trusts him and continues to follow that, you know, what his what his father has said to him, then there's nothing wrong with that. He may not understand it, but that's a lot different than doubting his father and going in a different direction and not obeying his father right so children don't always understand what their you know the parents tell them but they can still trust in them and so when it when it brings about this distrust in god and it causes us to go our own way then that's when it becomes sin but it's natural because we don't understand god was it a sin for uriah smith to teach that when mrs white had a public vision that this was from God, but that when she gave the testimonies that this was just her opinion? Yeah, that would be a sin. Was it a sin for Elder Butler to come back with articles saying that there are portions of the Bible that are not inspired? Yeah, that would be definitely. I would say so. It really, he said there was different levels of inspiration. Right. Which it is true. And 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 people use that it, it part of it was a way to attack spirit of prophecy. Because they say, well, Ellen White's inspired, but she's not as inspired as the Bible, which is just nonsense. Now comment from the chat. Jacob wrestled with Christ. Ellen White and William Miller pled with him to be delivered of their calling when they were called to teach and preach. If we are so called, if we are being called to teach or preach. Should we be looking to be delivered from that calling? If God well, sees, well, we, we may want we may God want to be, but uh, uh, we may, we may want, want to be, be but, it's but it's not, not safe, safe to to, to, uh, to uh, reject reject God's, God's calling. calling. Yeah, it certainly didn't work out too well for William Foy. Yeah, I'm thinking of Moses in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, if we reject. God's calling, or perhaps we're not prepared for his calling, there there can be 40 years in the wilderness before we get it, or God gets us. Well, you have examples in 
and the spirit of prophecy. Well, <clears throat> Miss White wasn't the first one that God came to. To um, it was a, it's another man that that he came to, but he rejected it, and you see what happened to him. Were there two before Ellen White's, or just yes. one? Or, yeah, William Foy being one. I'm just not recalling the name of the other off the top of my head. His last yeah. name was Foss. I can't recall the first name. Hayes and William, Foss. William Foss. Hayes and Foss. Hayes and Foss. Yeah, it was Hayes. It was Hayes and Foss that it didn't work out well for. William Foy had multiple things that he did later present that have had impact upon our understanding. So Foss followed what he was told to give, just not in the full decree or degree in which he should have followed. Now, the last point before the close of our time today is that Pruitt, in using Paulian's rules, says that God is creative. Let us give the professor this much. God certainly does set new precedents. He does new things. His part in the rep- Petition of history may vary from time to time in creative ways, though not in principle. It is here in the first lecture that he makes a distinction between the believer and the scholar. He says that the believer has commitments that he brings to his studies, while the scholar tests such commitments, seeking for evidence to bolster or to overthrow them. I, for one, wish scholars were more skeptical in their re- rigorous testing of their own scholarly ideas. And I wish believers were more skeptical of the scholars that teach them. But it is skepticism regarding what the prophets say that make a man a fool, whether or not he professes to be scholarly. Would you have any problem with that, with this? Yeah, lesson? this one point. No, that's definitely correct. It, again, every time I talk, it says my internet is unstable. But uh, so this point is extremely important. And it, and it reminds me of another problem that often happens when people who are in sort of our position, we're not scholars per se, but we have so much trust in our own ideas. It's not really just the problem of the scholar. Every one of us needs to be much more skeptical in regards to our own understanding. Right. So we can look down upon the scholar. Oh, you know, the scholars, they have this problem, but we all have this problem. It's common to mankind. We, we are not skeptical enough of our own thinking. And, and so we're fools. Doesn't matter whether you profess to be scholarly or unscholarly or whatever. If you're trusting in, um, yeah, that's a good question. What does commitments mean? I don't know. Kelly asks. Yeah, right. I'm not sure what commitments are that he brings to his studies. That's not really well defined. But but the but the main point here is that we need to be skeptical of ourselves and not skeptical skeptical of God's word. Don't don't commit. What is that word? Commitments. Don't that mean that you committed to something? Yeah, but we don't know what he means by the believer has commitments and the scholar tests commitments. I have no idea. What I know what a commitment is, but I have no idea what he means by the believer has commitments. I'd suggest perhaps commitment to one's own settled belief already, like you're committed to this belief and you test other things against that commitment to your belief. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I, I don't know what it means. I, I, I don't think that it's very clear. I have no idea. Okay. We're coming close to the end of our time here today. We're going to have many things that we're going to have to consider as we are then going to look to return to this study on that we began from what Uriah Smith had written. Any other thoughts or questions from what we have covered today? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the ability that you are giving us to reason from cause to effect. We thank you, Father, that we may come together to study, to address points, so that we may be truly as iron sharpens iron. Direct us through this day and all that you would have us to do. May your will be done. May your character be shown. Help us and guide us in all things. 
For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.